Although subsequent marginalist criticisms of Ricardo were more, though rough, Yevans fired the opening salvo quite dramatically. He explicitly formulated his utility-based theory of value in opposition to the labor theory. In his introduction to the labor, th or to the theory of political economy, he wrote, "Repeated reflection and inquiry have led me to somewhat novel opinion that." Value depends entirely upon utility. Prevailing opinions make labor rather than utility the origin of value. And there are even those who distinctly assert that labor is the cause of value. I show, on the contrary, that we have only to trace out carefully that the natural laws of variation of utility as depending upon the quantity of commodity in our possession. In order to arrive at a satisfactory theory of exchange, of which the ordinary laws of supply and demand are a necessary consequence. This, is, this theory is an in harmony with facts, and whenever there is an, a, any apparent reason for the belief that labor is the cause of value, we obtain an explanation of the reason. Labor is found often to determine value, but only in an indirect manner by varying the degree of utility of the commodity through an increase uh, or limitation of the supply. On the face of it, the bald assertion that utility determines value seems utter nonsense. The only way the supplier of a good can charge according to its utility to the buyer is if he is in a monopoly situation, which enables him to change whatever the market will bear without regard to the cost of production. But by qualifying this statement to treat marginal utility as a dependent variable determined by quant the quantity in our possession, he makes it clear that the influence of value on price assumes a snapshot of the balance of supply and demand in a market at any given time. This is also a shortcoming of the Austrian utility theory, as it was developed by Bohm Barwerk and his Austrian followers. Up to the present, not only did the later Austrians inadequately treat the time dimension, but they were forced to a position of radical skepticism regarding the notions of equilibrium price. In order to avoid a Marshallian understanding of dynamic effect of production cost on price through the effect of market price on supply to the extent that Yevans admitted the dimension of time and made him made supply itself a function of the supplier's response to market price. He was also forced to admit that the effect of labor on value in an indirect manner, in much the same way that Marshall was later to do with his famous scissors. Bohm Barwerk was at his best in systematically analyzing the exceptions to labor theory and the cost principle. In so doing, however, he was forced to admit a rough statistical correlation between cost and price in cases of reproducible goods, and in so admitting, he was forced to reduce his argument to quibbling over the required level of generality of a theory of value. So, Bohm Barwerk, having set the terms of discussion, let us proceed to examine his list of exceptions to Ricardo's cost theory of price. He begins with a general statement of his criticism. Experience shows that the exchange value of goods stands in proportion to that amount of labor which their production costs only in the case of one class of goods, and even then only approximately. Well known as this should be, considering that the facts on which it rests are so familiar, it is very seldom estimated at its proper value. Of course, everybody, including the socialist writers, agree that experience does not entirely confirm that the labor principle. It is commonly imagined, however, that the cases in which actual facts confirm the labor principle form the rule, and that the cases which contradict the principle form a relatively insignif insignificant exception. This view is very erroneous, and to correct it once and for all, I shall put together in groups the exceptions by which experience proves the labor principle to be limited in economic life. We shall see that the exceptions so much preponderate that they
scarcely leave any room for the rule. As we shall see later, though, it is questionable value to measure quantitatively the exceptions to the law of value. It makes more sense to treat the effect of cost as a first-order generalization, and then to treat scarcity exceptions as a second as second order deviations from the generalization. This is this was the approach of both Ricardo in treating cost and scarcity as twin principles of value, and Marshall with his scissors. The longer the time frame, the more cost is shown to be the main influence on the price of goods whose this supply can be increased in response to demand and scarcity. Rents are shown to be short term deviations through which the cost principle works itself out. The first exception to the labor of theory of value Bull and Barwork listed was that for scarce good with an inelastic supply. 1. From the scope of labor principle are accept, accepted all scarce goods that, from actual or legal hindrances, cannot be reproduced at all or can be reproduced only in limited amount. Ricardo names, by the way of example, rare statues and pictures, scarce books and coins, wines of peculiar quality and adds the remark that such goods form only a very small portion of the goods daily exchanged in the market. If, however, we consider that to this category belongs the whole of land and further those numerous goods in the production of which patents, copyrights, and trade secrets come into play, it will be found that the extent of these exceptions is by no means inconsiderable. Goods that are permanently inelastic in supply are indeed the most fundamental exception to Ricardo's labor theory of value. Such completely inelastic goods are, however, a relatively minor portion of all commodities. The production of most goods can eventually be expanded to a level of sufficient to meet, sufficient to meet demand. For such elastic goods, the only question is the duration required for such adjustment. Bo and Barwork address that exception, not really an exception at all, as we shall see, since it does not in any way violate the correspondence between labor value and equilibrium price, in his fourth point quoted below. As for the example of rare works or uh, of art, etc., Bo and Barwork himself admitted that Ricardo had acknowledged them. The final group of exceptions, land, patents, etc., deser deserves close consideration. Bone Barwork lumped together all goods with an inelastic supply, regardless of whether their inelasticity results from actual or legal hindrances. But the mutualist version of labor theory of value states that accepting goods naturally inelastic in supply profit results from unequal exchange itself a result of state intervention in the market. To the extent that scarcity of land is natural and absentee landlord claims are not enforced by the state, economic rent on land is a form of scarcity, rent that will prevail under any system, but to the extent that the scarcity is artificial, resulting from government or absentee landlord restrictions on access to vacant land or landlord rent on those actual occupying and using land, the mutualist contention is that such rent is a deviation from the normal exchange value caused by unequal exchange. Patents, likewise, are such a deviation being nothing but a monopoly imposed by the state. Such examples, therefore, have no bearing whatsoever on the vali va validity of labor theory of value. As his second item in the list of exceptions, Roland Barwork mentioned the product of skilled labor. In the process of his discussion, he ridiculed Marx's attempt to salvage a uniform labor time standard by reducing skilled labor to a multiple of common labor. In this, Bohm Barwork was entirely correct. The validity of this criticism was one factor in our attempt to rework the labor theory of value on the basis of Smith's attempt to on Smith's and Hodgkin's subjective toil and trouble in place of Ricardo and Marx embodied labor time. 
This will be discussed in detail in a later chapter. The third kind of exception similarly included those goods not, it is true, a very important class that are produced by abnormally badly paid labor, but the labor theory of value, as Ricardo formulated it at least, stated that the exchange values of goods were regulated by the quantity of labor embodied in them, not by the wages of labor. And according to the mutualist version of the theory, low wages in relation to the total product of labor are a result of unequal exchange between capital and labor within the production process. The most important exception after the first was the fourth, the fluctuations of commodity prices above and below the axis of their labor value in response to the changes in supply and demand. Four. A fourth exception